there's nothing good in me you are love you are love on display for all to see you are light you are light when the darkness closes in you are hope you are hope you have covered all my sins You're the reason that I sing You are life, you are life In the death is lost to sing Even though I'm running to your arms I'm running to your arms The riches of your love Will always be in all Your embrace, light of the world, forever reign. You are more, you are more than my words will ever say. You are Lord, you are Lord, all creation will proclaim. You are here, you are here. Your presence I made home You are God, you are God Of all else I'm letting go And though I'm right here, I'm God And though I'm running to your arms I'm running to your arms The riches of your love Will always be Jesus of you. 
sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. Was grace that taught my heart to fear and grace my fears release. How precious did that grace so clear the Chains are gone, I've been set free, my God, my Savior has ransomed me, and like a God, His mercy reigns, Shall soon dissolve like snow. The sun forbear to shine. But God who called me here below will be. thank you so much that through your love and your sacrifice and your amazing grace you have set us free and we can have hope and we can have joy even when the circumstances around us are hard and even when what life throws at us you know shakes us to the core thank you Lord that our hope is secure and in that we can trust
Heavenly Father, you always amaze me Let your kingdom come in my world and in my life You give me the food I need to live through the day Forgive me as I forgive the people that wronged me Leave me far from temptation Deliver me from, from the evil are composing Not a note is out of tune or out of place I look at the meadow and stare at the flowers Better dress than any girl on a wedding day So why do I worry? Why do I freak out? God knows what I need You know Is now advancing In vain, my heart in vain This broken town The kingdom of heaven Is buried treasure Sell yourself to buy the one you found There's two things you told me One, that you are strong And that you love me Yes, that you love me
Father God, I just want to thank you so much for this time of worship. It's so hard sometimes to just clear our heads, all the distractions, God. You say in your word to give you undistracted devotion. God, in a world where material things, God, especially during this Lent season where we're trying to, we're trying to rid ourselves of things that we make idols, God. Worship should be pure, God. It should be entirely for you. And I ask that as we end out this week, God, as we take this time of rest over spring break, God, that people would not idolize, God, wasting time. The people in their lives, God, all of us have people in our lives that need to know you and need to know your love. God, let this time, all of this time we have this next week, God, not go to waste. God, let it be intentionally loving, God, the people in our lives, God, and most of all, our relationship with you. God, let's make you first. Return to our first love. Return to our first love. God, I just thank you so much for your grace and your mercy and that you love every person in here despite their failures, God. Despite relationships that aren't working out, God, you know better. Your love is stronger that you would win out in every place, in every circumstance this next week, God, and that you would give intentional love and motivate your children, God, to further your kingdom. In Jesus' name. You, you may, may be seated. <laughs> Thank you to our chapel worship team this morning for leading us in worship as Precious Movements takes their places before they will offer a special musical number. We want to thank you for attending chapel this morning, the Wednesday before spring recess. So we're grateful for breaks in our schedule so that we can uh, rejuvenate ourselves and get ready for the second part of the semester. It is my privilege this morning to uh, introduce our chapel speaker who is on the faculty here at Eastern University, an associate professor of sociology, Dr. John Montero, who's been here teaching eight years. And as I speak to students in his class, um, he is uh, insightful, engaging, and really smart. And we're grateful for smart faculty members here this morning. Um, Dr. Montero did his undergraduate and master's degree at Olivet Nazarene University in Illinois. And he did his doctorate, PhD, at Drew University in Madison, New Jersey, uh, in the area of religion and society. Now, I'm going to show you something that we dug up from the archives, um, in the uh, historical archives at Drew University. I don't want you to be frightened, but this uh, picture that I'm going to show you is circa about 1991. I will show you the picture right now, and you'll notice, hopefully, um, a f uh, let's see if we can get that on the screen quickly. Uh, the person in the middle is me. I know, I know. I see some of you tearing up already. And the person on, on the far right is Dr. Montero. Um, and the other fellow, well, we stay in touch a little bit with Andy. We were resident directors together in graduate school for one year at Drew University. So I got to know John um, back in the day, as we'll say. And it's been such a delight to have him uh, be here now at Eastern for the last eight years. So John, uh, he was a good resident director. A lot of programming we did for that year. And it was a great experience. On the next slide, Dr. Montero will be speaking this morning right after Precious Movements on the Apostles' Creed, the section the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, and the forgiveness of sins, continuing our chapel series. So thank you, John, for being here this morning. And now, Precious Movements. Thank you. 
presence of the Lord, I think. presence, Lord. Thank you, Precious Movements, for that. Good morning. Anybody out there? Good morning. I'm delighted to be here this morning. Thank you, Joe, for inviting me uh, to come and share as part of this series on the Apostles' Creed. Uh, back in the day, how do you like uh, Dr. Modica's young Mark's look? The only thing that can beat that, I guess, is that leather jacket. Yeah, Just need the motorcycle and the tattoo, and you're all ready to go. I knew him as a wise man, uh, but I had second thoughts when he pulled that up on the screen. Um, <clears throat> uh, thanks, Joe, for having me uh, this morning. Uh, I'd like to, uh, if you will allow me, take a slightly different approach to uh, our treatment of the Apostles' Creed in this series. And rather than going to a deep theological dissertation, I'd like to share with you what I uh, consider a testimonial reflection on the meaning of this particular section of the Apostles' Creed, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, 
the forgiveness of sins. I was born into a, Catholic, into a Protestant family in a place that was 97% Catholic. Talk about being an outsider. The place was not even a country at that time. It was a colonial territory, a small little archipelago out there by Africa's Atlantic coast. At the time, the two most powerful forces in the islands were, number one, the dictatorial regime of Antonio Salazar, one of Europe's worst despots, and second, the Catholic Church, which, as the state church, dominated everything from birth and naming ceremonies all the way to funeral rites. As a boy, I heard stories of how the island's first Protestants were bullied, persecuted, stoned by Catholic mobs and jailed by Catholic authorities. Needless to say, growing up Catholic was not a term of endearment in my religious circles. And our tiny little group sought to find every way possible to make sure to mark our distinction from the big church. We grumbled, for example, about those holidays that were named after Catholic saints, though we really didn't mind the time off. Since the Catholics seemed to uh, use the word communion quite a bit, they talked about receiving communion Sunday after Sunday, they talked about first communion, etc. We pretty much boycotted the term. And so our sacrament became the Lord's Supper instead. And then there was the Apostles' Creed. And that bit about the Holy Catholic Church. You see, for us to repeat that in ritual fashion in our own services was more than we can bear. So we changed that part to, I believe, in the Holy Universal Church. As if that didn't bring its own issues with it. So many distinctions, so many lines of separation. Which makes me wonder, what was Joe thinking when he chose this Protestant boy to talk about the Catholic section of the Apostles' Creed? To be fair, it's not just the word Catholic that may be problematic for some of us. For some, it's the other qualifier, holy, especially when attached to church. For others, it may be the word communion, or even forgiveness, that poses a challenge. For some of us, it may actually be tempting to change the Apostles' Creed into something of an Apostle's question, and instead of stating, I believe, to ask, do I? Do I really believe the church? Do I believe the church wholly? when in so many ways it seems to fall below the standard of, per of perfection that we hold it to. Do I believe the church Catholic when my own denominational tradition or my own outsider status may leave me feeling excluded from its fellowship, whether on account of my place of birth or gender or immigrant status, sexuality, race, social class, or some other reason? Do I believe the church forgiving? If my own search for forgiveness in the church, I may have met just the opposite. For some of us, stating our belief in God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit is a given and a blessing. We embrace it and celebrate it as an essential matter of our Christian faith. But believing in the church may be a bit different sometimes. Believing in the church may give some of us a bit of pause sometimes. The starting point of belief in the church, of course, is the fact that it's God's idea. 
The church is God's work and God's instrument on earth. Jesus declared, I will build my church. And this is a basic theological premise of the Christian faith, that God is at work in the world through the church, the community of Christ's followers. In one of the earliest, most influential, influential statements on religion in all of social science, the French sociologist Emile Durkheim maintained that religion is a social phenomenon, not separable from the community in which it exists. In fact, in the simple societies where Durkheim did his ethnographic work, religion was not only an eminently social fact, it was the primary social glue that held the group together and gave it its identity and its moral grounding. Now, I know that some of us would resist equi equating church and religion in this fashion. Others would dismiss both altogether. In 1985, Robert Bella and his associates wrote in their influential book, Habits of the Heart, about Sheilaism. Sheilaism was the self-described personal religion of a young nurse named Sheila Larson. Get it? Sheila, Sheilaism? I believe in God, she said. I'm not a religious fanatic. I can't remember the last time I went to church. My faith has carried me a long way. It's Sheilaism, just my own little voice. It's just try to love yourself and be gentle with yourself. Today, by some estimates, as many as 20% of Americans like Sheila claim no church or religious affiliation. Many prefer a personal quest for spirituality, one that is open, creative, eclectic, and unencumbered by institutional trappings. They call themselves spiritual, but not religious. Writing two weeks ago in the Huffington Post, Philip Goldberg said the following about the spiritual but not religious and their quest for spirituality. They wish to pursue it wherever it leads them. If traditional religion gave them the inner experience they yearn for, if it answered the big existential questions in a satisfying way, if it truly nourished their desire for spiritual growth, they'd stay instead of stray. But stray is apparently what they do, and go on to blaze a path of mystical spirituality that is individualized, subjective, and quite in step with the drumbeat of modernity. The problem with this mystical Lone Ranger spirituality, says theologian Ernst Trelch, is that being devoid of any collective institutions, rituals, shared texts, or communities, it is unhinged and thus unstable and ultimately unsustainable, or what writer Jeffrey MacDonald calls a type of poverty that's self-imposed and ultimately self-deluding. Religion is about that basic human need to collect with a reality larger than ourselves, and that is something that is experienced in community. There is no such thing, said John Wesley, as private religion. Solitary religion is not to be found in the gospel of Christ. The gospel of Christ knows of no religion but social religion. What then does it mean to say, I believe in the church. The theologian Justo Gonzalez offers an interesting insight here. Belief in the church is not the same as belief in the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, for that would be idolatry. Instead, it's the recognition that it is within the context of the church that faith is experienced, and that despite its flaws, and its failures, and yes, its brokenness. 
The faith community is the indispensable collective platform that gives grounding and sustenance to our individual search for spiritual meaning. So we believe that God is at work in our midst through the Holy Spirit, and we do so by means of our connection with God's church. Through the Holy Spirit, the church is made holy. It is not holy because of some standard of moral purity or perfection. The church is holy because it is the locus of continued activity by the Holy Spirit in the communing among the saints and in the sharing of holy things with one another and with all who are in need. In the little Protestant enclave of my childhood, we had a problem, a bit of a problem anyway, with the Catholics' use of the word saint. You see, theirs were so many saints, apparently, that they could honor each one individually, each day of the calendar, and still probably have to wait list a few. In my brand of Protestantism, the word saint had much more restricted use. We could talk about Saint Peter or Saint Paul, Saint John, but we didn't know quite what to make of a Saint Teresa or Saint Benedict, or even Saint Mary. In fact, in our own tradition, we emphasize a very tight connection between the word saint in the adjective sense of holy, santo in Portuguese, and sanctification, santificação, which for us was a core matter of doctrine. We called it entire sanctif sanctification and understood it as a deeply personal experience subsequent to conversion that freed the individual from individual sin. By contrast to the Catholics, whose saints were so deemed by the collective decision of the church, our version of sanctity was tied to this intensely individual, even private experience. Now, without disowning my Protestant upbringing, I must acknowledge that, it, that there is something in the Catholic tradition that profoundly resonates with Durkheim's theory of religion. For Durkheim, the sacred is defined and maintained by the community. And the individual's experience of holiness rests on the com communal recognition of the holy. Hence the need for, for congregating, for connecting, for ritual, for sharing, in order to nurture the collective experience of the sacred. In this recognition are echoes of something Jesus himself said. When two or three are gathered in my name, there I am also. The experience of the Holy, the Holy One, Father, Son, and Spirit, is intimately tied to the practice of gathering in Christ's name. It is the experience of Jesus blessing those who come together in his name with his sanctifying presence. God's presence and work in the church renders the church holy and calls it to be Catholic. As I grew, I came to recognize the word Catholic in the Apostles' Creed as one that was not bad after all. With most of my fellow believers, I came to understand the idea of Catholic to mean universal, present throughout the world, active everywhere. Yet there is here, perhaps, something else to be considered. As Justo Gonzalez points out, one translation of the original meaning of the word Catholic can be according to the whole. That is, what makes the church Catholic is not its presence everywhere, but rather the fact that people from everywhere are part of it and contribute to it. 
In other words, it is by embodying experiences and perspectives from multiple places and manifold histories that the church lives out its Catholicity. Yes, says Cameroonian theologian Jean-Marc Ella, the church is one entity, but this does not abolish its differences. It integrates them. To talk then about the Catholic Church is not to single out a particular organization or institution, but to affirm the existence of the church even in the midst of our diversity. And so today, when I come to that section of the Apostles' Creed, I recite it with joyful gratitude for belonging to a very special community indeed. What makes the community special is not some illusory claim to perfection or purity or organizational prowess. What makes it special is the continued work of the Holy Spirit in its midst and the blessed fellowship of all who are united in the forgiveness of sins. Forgiveness they have received and forgiveness that they continually extend. Forgiveness and the church, you see, in this sense, are inseparable. As a community, the church recognizes her own sinfulness and her own need for continued forgiveness from God. At the same time, the church also is the locus of forgiveness. As John Calvin once put it, away from her bosom, one cannot hope for any forgiveness of sins or any salvation. Otto Maduro is a Venezuelan lay Catholic who was my doctoral dissertation advisor and who this past year served as president of the American Academy of Religion. In his book, Mapas para a Festa, Maduro tells the following story. During my graduate school years, I, along with a, a number of my fellow students, became a bit of an atheist. There were many factors, but one of of them was my frustration with the church. Despite its great public statements to the contrary, it seemed to me that the church's actual life and practice continued to be simply a matter of acquiescence to the powerful of this world and insensitivity to the poor. So I left the church. Some years passed until one day some friends invited me to a talk by Peruvian priest Gustavo Gutierrez. At the end of the talk, Father Gutierrez invited to Mass anyone who wished to attend. By then, a remarkable thing had happened. As I sat there and listened to the talk and shared in the experience and response of those who were also in attendance with me, it became clear to me that the church that I had been dreaming of all those years was coming to life and taking root right there before our very eyes, right inside the church I had abandoned some five years earlier. So I returned to my church and to the struggle to make my church a welcoming home for all who sought it. Like Maduro, many who have left the church did so because they could not forgive it. Too rigid, insensitive, stuffy, passé. Many others left the church because forgiveness was not extended to them. Instead, they were judged, rejected, questioned, or simply ignored. But as it turns out, forgiveness and the church are inseparable. For Calvin, there is no experiencing forgiveness of sins away from the church. But the opposite is just as true. Without forgiveness, there is no church. For in large part, it is forgiveness that enables the Christian to resist what Charles Cranfield once called the continual temptation to fall away from the church. It's a temptation that is particularly strong in this late modern age of hyper-individualism, unlimited choice, experimentation, and Twitter, where illusory Lone Ranger spiritualities like Shilaism seem to resonate with significant numbers of the population. But from Durkheim's secular insight to Jesus' instruction and promise, 
to the teachings of the church in the Apostles' Creed, we are reminded that faith is uncompromisingly communal and that to experience it, we must do so in community. So however our Christian community may be constituted, whatever its denominational banner, worship style, or particular circumstances, may it be for us the vital place that anchors, sustains, and nurtures our living faith. And as Hebrews 10.25 urges us, let us not give up meeting together, but let us encourage one another and strive to make our church a welcoming home for all to experience forgiveness of sins in the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. Amen. You are dismissed.